good morning, a blessed morning to all the administrators, faculty, and personnel of the Catholic Education Association of the Philippines, member schools all over the Philippines. I am Brother Ed Colmenares of the Society of Jesus from Simbang Lingkod ng Bayan, and I will be your moderator today. And welcome to the fifth session of our 2021 SEAP GPG National Conference. If you tuned in yesterday on the SEAP Facebook page or YouTube channel, we had the talk on God Encounters and Meaningful Connections. Dr. Stella Padilla and Dr. Jessica Joy Candelario shared to us some creative strategies in handling or facilitating online recollections. But for this uh, morning, we will be focusing more on how we can engage the youth uh, to be more engaged citizens uh, in leading up to the 2022 elections, but also focusing on how they can be socially and politically involved even beyond our elections. However, before we continue, let us begin first our webinar with a brief prayer. And let us remember that we are always in the holy presence of our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct Lord, we beseech you that all our actions by your holy inspiration be carried on by your gracious assistance, and that every prayer, deed, and work of ours may begin always from you, and by you be happily ended. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, good morning to all those who are tuning in to the Say Up Facebook page. We are also cross-posting in the Facebook page of Radyo Katipunan and of Simbahang Lingkod ng Bayan. Welcome once again. For those who just tuned in with us, we are at our fifth session of the 2021 uh, Say Up Jeep G National Conference. And we will continue to deliver our webinars on the set platforms earlier. If you have not done so yet, may we ask you, of course, to like this webinar by pressing the thumbs up button on your screens and to subscribe either to the YouTube, SLB, or Radyo Katipunan channels now. So please go ahead and press that red button. Like, subscribe, and share. Uh, now for some reminders. As the talk is ongoing, we encourage you to post your questions or comments at the comment section on our YouTube and Facebook channels. We will ask you and we will ask these questions or read the comments later during the Q&A portion. For those who are looking forward to certificates, since we get a lot of queries about certificates, please be informed that you will receive the certificate of attendance only upon completion of the evaluation form. The link has already been posted as part of the caption of this video, both on YouTube and on Facebook. Please note that the link will only go live only from 11.30 a.m. until 5 p.m. today. So if you click it now, it's not going to open yet. You'll have to wait a little later. We encourage you to answer this form and you will receive your certificate of attendance within three to five days. And lastly, uh, this is a free webinar brought to you in partnership with the Private Education Association Assistance Committee or PEAC. And again, we are giving this webinar to you for free. But if you want to pay it forward, you may want to donate to SEAP's Kapatirang Kamagong Fund. It is our fund for helping the poor and struggling SEAP mission schools because we heal as one. You can see now on the screen the account details should you want to donate. And lastly, for those who will be sharing this webinar post to your networks, please post it with a hashtag, hashtag SayUpCares, hashtag I love Catholic Men. Now, let me introduce our uh, session this morning. Leading up towards the elections, and we're just roughly a little over a year for the next general elections, we realize as Catholic educators that a good uh, our immediate audience would be the youth in our universities and colleges. And we have, and many of us, I'm sure, are eager to find out ways of mobilizing them to be more socially and politically involved. I'm sure we've seen our students and our alumni being active and woke on social media. But how do we harness that energy so that they become more socially and politically involved even beyond the elections? Or what issues are they to face? Are, or what they can consider in light of the coming elections. And so, we would like to uh, 
share some insights with you or maybe even some research. That's why we invited our two speakers this morning. Our first speaker is former Undersecretary Leon Flores III. He is one of the Philippines' foremost youth development experts, having served as former chairman and CEO of the National Youth Commission from 2011 to 2014. Having grown uh, and uh, studied in, in the University of the Philippines in Cebu, well, Mr. Leon has a lot of involvements here, including his reforms for the Sangguni Ang Kabataan, amendments to the Juvenile Justice and Welfare Act, Reproductive Health Law, and he also piloted the Philippine Youth Development Index. But even after his term as uh, NYC chair, he is very much involved in a lot of other works with the UN, with the Ateneo School of Government, with the deputy, uh, with the UP Econ Foundation before, and USAID for some time. So, uh, enough of my introductions. I'll let you guys meet Mr. Leon Flores the Third. So, welcome, Mr. Leon, and the. Dagan salamat, Brother Ed, for that introduction. And um, dagan salamat sa uh, SEAP at sa SLB for inviting me here. It's an honor and privilege. Uh, I always take the time out of my regular life to um, really um, engage with our educators and young people simply because you form a very important and critical part, a mission-critical part of our democracy. So, I'm here to talk about uh, youth goals, political participation, and inclusive democracy. So I'll, I'll have roughly 20 minutes to 30 minutes. I'll, I'll share uh, what are the context that we are operating in now, how I feel that our young people and our electorate is somewhat disempowered, and ano ba yung pag-isip ngayon ng mga kabataan also, politically. So I think we've, you've had a good program already for the past few days. Here, uh, we are zooming in on political participation and inclusive democracy, so to speak. So with my um, experience and, and um, in the National Youth Commission, and I've been very active also in many initiatives, including anti-EPAL campaign. I'm part of the Right to Know Right Now Coalition, pushing for the freedom of information, uh, political reform bill, uh, among others. So... Uh, medyo daghantag mga advocacies uh, at the inclusive democracy front and right now we're also coming up soon with our study on SK reform uh, pretty soon so hopefully as educators um, we can find time to really share what we have here at uh, the, the findings and takeaways that we have about our democracy uh, and, and how we can also help share this to more and more young people so for those listening um, I will show naman later my, my contact numbers if you feel that you want to email or continue the conversation thereafter. You can also add me on Facebook and, and follow me on Facebook, Leon Flores, uh, if you want to con continue the conversation. So um, let's start. So uh, I think um, in the sauna for 2020, this was the real sauna that we saw during the lockdown. Primarily what we saw is that um, we had the worst covid 19 outbreak. We had the worst lockdown um, all over, What perhaps one of the strongest and strictest lockdown in the world, so they say. And right in the midst, in the midst of the pandemic, we have some uh, controversy on the field health. We have some controversy on the Dolomite of, of Manila Bay. And it looks like um, with the economy crashing uh, right into recession as of August, it looks like BC Pass uh, before that took to to close the likes of ABS-CBN. So it looks like medyo walang, walang focus ang, ang ating pamahalan ano, to, to make sure that we uh, focus on the health pandemic. Parang as if walang health pandemic na nangyari. Which also explains why ang dami, ang laki, ang dami, dami ng cases ng Pilipinas. So uh, this, is, this was last year. But the news right now, as of January, Ito naman yung humaharap sa atin, no? 
the Philippine economy shrinks more than expected. We have the worst GDP for, for Q4 of 2020. Um, in fact, Vietnam, Taiwan, and China are posting positive growth. Tayo, um, we are posting one of the worst uh, performance in, in, in terms of economic performance of the GDP. So this is the recent one. And of course, ramdam natin, ako dahil lagi akong kumakain, ramdam na ramdam natin yung pag-increase ng price. Uh, at first, sabi nila, oy, tumaas yung presyo ng, ano, ng bilihin ng meat. O sige, magbibigan na lang tayo. Pero tumaas din yung presyo ng mga vegetables. So halos walang pagpipilian. And of course, there's the vaccine, um, so to speak, parang overpricing because bakit parang iba yung presyo ng vaccine natin sa vaccine, same brand, Sinovac, bakit iba yung presyo sa Indonesia or sa India? So these questions linger and uh, it looks like mas busy pa yung pamahala natin in somewhat pinning uh, the discussion on red tagging, on kung sino ba yung komunista um, and, and abrogating the DND-UP na, na, na accord. And it looks like there's still no focus. Uh, it looks like this is the kind of democracy we live in, no? wherein our government, instead of having laser focus on the health pandemic, it looks like we're preoccupied with so many other things. And, and, it, it, and we need our leaders to really, our leaders and our citizens also, because you have a part to play in making sure that we really fight this pandemic together. So what I'm going to show you next are, are examples or illustrations of how our people, kayo as electorate, tayo bilang electorate and voters are disempowered. So one is patronage politics. Um, and I see this now with, we see this during elections. Uh, patronage politics is parang meron kang patron. You see the politicians as your patron. Uh, sila humihingi tayo sa kanila. Sila yung tagasalba sa atin. There's that savior syndrome or mentality which is uh, somewhat uh, putting us at a disadvantage. Tinitingnan natin yung mga politician natin also as savior which is uh, really also a, a wrong way of looking at things. So ito yung problema. Pag, habang tumatakbo yung politicians natin, ang bibo-bibo. They give all sorts of promises. Ang babait nila, they, they, they smile, they handshake, they, they best put forward. Pero pag nasa ano na, pag nasa pwesto na or nasa poder na some of them we cannot find, hindi nagre-reply sa email, uh, iti-tweet mo hindi nagre-reply. So uh, iba sila during, during kumpanya, iba sila pag binoboto na or nakaupo na. Uh, hindi ko nilalahat ha, pero generally this is what we see on the ground. Um, the good news now is that merong Facebook, people can complain, people can rant, but at the same time engage them. So usually we encourage young people to write your congressman, to write your mayors, and be your vaccination plan nyo. So those are the things that we need to be able to do. But again, there's the certain duplicity, which is why it's very important for us to see behind the facade. Sino ba talaga itong politician na to? Ano ba yung track record niya? Ano ba yung nagawa na niya? To make sure that we write the uh, we vote the right people in place. So we also have a very weak political party system. Halos walang partido. Palipat-lipat. Dati sikat si Pinoy. Ang daming pumunta sa si Liberal Party. Etong mga ano na to, a lot of them are trapos, a lot of them are balimbings. After out of power na si Pinoy, punta naman si PDP laban. Dahil nandun, ito yung partido ni Duterte. So these politicians, it looks like sanay na sanay na sila. So medyo pakapalan din ang mukha. No, no, they're not loyal to a party. They're not loyal to, to an ideology or a principle. They're only loyal to their self-interest. So, mahalaga talaga na alamin natin sino ba talaga yung uh, um, naging loyal sa party because political parties are really the, ito yung parang recruitment, ano eh, the body, para siyang selection and recruitment body that finds sino ba yung mga magagaling na pwedeng i-pipeline natin sa, na mga politicians. Right now, we have a weak political party system. We have a weak uh, political finance system kung saan kahit sino pwedeng mag-invest, mga lobbyists, mga big interests, or even some big business can really invest in, in their manok uh, during the elections. So, there's an elite rule. Definitely, only few people, we are ruled by few families in the Philippines. Uh, we can see that at the national level. We can see that also at the local level. Ramdam natin ito. Uh, sa munisipyo, may ibang munisipyo, isang pangalan lang, paulit-ulit. Halos 
it's seemingly as if to appear sila lang yung magaling. Which we doubt, dahil ang gagaling ng Pilipino, ang gagaling, ang daming magagaling na kabataan na sana dapat tumakbo at and they have to build their names. So, para hindi tayo nagiging um, beholden only to a few families. So, there's the elites of wealth, this is the economic elite, and there are the political elites as well. So, um, this is the interplay between the economic elite and the political elite. The economic elite bankrolls the political elites as well. So, we are practically run by just a few families um, in the country, uh, both at the national and at the local level. So the challenge and the problem is that if and when the elites actually use or abuse their power in order to get contracts, in order to to secure contracts from government. So ito na yung, ano na, meron na tayong cronyism, so to speak, na nangyayari. Ito yung dynamism, which is to the disadvantage now of the Filipino people. Hindi ko nila lahat, ha? pero meron talagang iba na they really want to wrest power simply because it gives it, puts them at an advantage. So, nandyan pa rin yung vote buying. I'm sure yung mga bata dito, baka hindi nyo pa na-experience, sana hindi nyo experience or kung meron mga mag-aabot sa inyo ng pera, i-decline natin or i-donate nyo na lang to your charity of choice. Ano? So, meron pa rin nangyayari. In fact, we've heard, as we were doing research on SK, meron pa rin mga vote buying even at the level of SK, a uh, federation level at sa uh, local level ng SK. So ito naman, uh, parang binenta mo na yung boto mo, binenta mo yung kinabukasan mo for a measly 45 cents per day. Ito nga yung meme na kumakalat. So marami pa rin mga Apple, every now and then they they really brazenly put their faces uh, kahit hindi kagandahan or kagwapuhan, nilalagay yung mga pinapaskil yung mukha nila sa tarpaulin, uh, nilalagay nila sa mga cellphone, mga sapatos, uh, ang dami-daming ang dami-dami pa rin but it went down a bit we were active in 2013 to 2015 with the anti-Apple movement nag-shame campaign kami so sana you can, we can continue to shame those politicians dahil, dahil hindi naman nila pera yung mga proyekto pera natin yan pera ng taong bayan sabi nga ni Mayor Vico Soto diba? so in fact some politicians na, during the campaign in 2019 ang laki-laki ng billboards um, merong iba naman nilalagay yung mukha nila, nilagay yung pangalan talaga nila sa panty na pinamimigay so ang weird lang ano, na umabot tayo sa ganitong punto ayan so this is where our taxes go kay, kay mayor yata napunta yung taxes meron namang mga barangay officials na nasuspend nagpatarpulin pa when tapos na yung suspension nila welcome back our suspended barangay officials as if proud pa sila na nasuspend sila so Medyo nakakatawa tong demokrasya natin and we, there should be no space for things like this. Dahil I think politics is a noble profession that you should all aspire for, that good youth leaders should aspire for. Even during the pandemic, meron ding mga lumalabas na mga ano no, mga pangalan. At least hindi na masyado mukha lang, ano lang print out lang ng billiards uh, habang kahit namimigay ng itlog at saging na saba. But there are examples of LGUs Nakita natin na wala yung pagmumukha ng mayor nila. Kaya naman pala. We can have leaders who do not, na hindi makapal yung mukha. Kaya naman sa Marikina City that it is the project of the Marikina government. That it is the project of Pasig, lungsod ng Pasig. Ito yung branding na gusto natin. Yung brand ng LGU, taxpayers' money. Dahil tayo naman yung nagbabayad sa mga proyektong iyon. And people were also disempowered or when, when, when they brazenly, itong mga binoto natin na congressman, part ba kayo ng distrito nila? 70 million Filipinos supported the ABS-CBN franchise renewal. Imagine, tatlo sa apat na Pilipino supportado ang pag-renew pag ng franchise ng ABS-CBN. Then mahalaga yung role nila in, new, in providing news, in giving information. Sa bagyo, sila lang yung nakakaabot ng ibang mga areas na hindi naabot ng ibang station or radio station. And Veritas Good Service supports the People's Initiative. Pero 70 million Filipinos support ABS-CBN pero 70 congressmen lang ang nag-decide para sa atin. Can you imagine that? So I hope you can, uh, I'm part of the Prima Kapamilya. If you want to help us gather signatures to bring back the ABS-CBN franchise, feel free to email me so we can uh, link you with our volunteers on the ground. So, there's a dominance of political dynasties. Uh, I'll just breeze through some of the slides that are here. 
uh, most definitely we can see the same family names. But uh, the question is, do dynasties hinder development? So, meron tayong thin dynasty. Ito yung sunod-sunod. After ng asawa, yung after ng bana, yung asawa naman. Pero meron din tayong fat dynasties. Parang tulad ko na mataba. Na sabay-sabay. Dungan ni sila na ay mayor ang iyang asawa kay vice mayor. Na ay mayor ang iyang anak kay uh, councilor. So, these are the uh, fat dynasty. So, Based on the study of Mendoza, Beha, Vinida, and Yap in 2016, there's really a link. Claro, na merong kaugnayan ang poverty or kahirapan sa mga dynasties. Empirical evidence shows na, the, that more dynasties cause greater poverty. So, ibig sabihin, nagdudulot, may causation, nagdudulot ng kahirapan ang presensya ng mga dynasties, especially sa labas ng Metro Manila. Mas pronounced ito sa labas ng Metro Manila. Simply because nakikita naman natin ito. Si mayor ng munisipyo, and you can see this, siya may ari ng gasoline station, siya may ari ng resort, siya may ari ng catering service, yung asawa niya may ari ng hotel. So these mayors natin na binoboto, nakikita niyo naman sila lang yung yumayaman. Ginagamit ang posisyon, inaabuso ang posisyon upang pagyamanin ang pamilya nila imbis na talagang mag serbisyo sa bayan. So the landscape now is that dominated talaga. From If you see, lalong pumupula, ibig lang sabihin nito, dumadami ng dumadami ang fat dynasties. Okay? So dumadami yung presence ng, um, ng sabay-sabay na mga dynasties sa governor level, vice governor level, at sa uh, members ng Congress. So pasadahan ko lang to yung iba. Uh, these are just the numbers. No? Ito yung mga probinsya na malakas yung mga dynasties. Uh, and dami-dami uh, part siguro nito I'm sure some of you are, are, are in these provinces so may kamag-anak congress din tayo magkapatid mag-asawa um, brother-in-law all in the same uh, congress now all 267 magkasabay-sabay din sila uh, na nandyan sa, sa nandyan sa kongreso natin ngayon so sa governors naman makikita natin na ang dami-dami na meron konti lang yung walang relatives Like ito sa Cebu, apat sila. May isang congressman, isang mayor, dalawang councilor. Okay? So, sa Bulacan at Batangas, at least wala. Walang relative. So, that's good, no? Kay Governor Mandanas at Governor Fernando. So, yung iba, meron talaga. So, meron din naman tayong mga bright spots. Ano? Of course, si Mayor Magalong lately na con- enrolled in the controversy ni Tim Mayor. Yeah, party kasi kasama pa yung asawa niya. Na-remove ng mask. But anyway, Uh, last year naman he did a good job in contact tracing but now I hope they, they do better you know? and he can really put his foot down uh, but Mayor Magalong beat um, Bilog who was incumbent vice mayor and part of a dynasty so si Isko Moreno naman beat Joseph Estrada uh, non-dynastic si Isko at si Joseph Estrada six years in power former president and, and his family is also da, dami, marami sa pamilya niya ang nasa politika Um, of course, in Dinagat Island, ito yung Ecleo. There's the Ecleo uh, na matagal na ring uh, dynasty sa Dinagat Island. Uh, ito, takita nyo amidst the the uh, poverty in their island, um, ang laki-laki ng parang malapalasyo yung bahay nila. No? So, nabit sila ni Kaka Bagaw, who was a former uh, human rights lawyer and then naging uh, congresswoman, eventually nag-governor ng Dinagat Island who's doing an extremely good job in handling the health pandemic sa dinagat. Of course, very sikat sa, sa media now, no? and because it's doing really well and performing really well in terms of good governance, itong si, um, si Pasig City Mayor Vico Soto, who beat the Eusebios, who for 30 years, tatlong dekada nang namamayagpag ang mga Eusebios sa Pasig City. Uh, Vico Soto started as councillor, won as first number one councillor in Pasig City and then eventually run for mayor. Uh, many were saying, bata ka pa, napakaano mo pa. Of course, um, and, and I saw because I helped him in his campaign to a certain degree in my own little way. Uh, I help people. Nakita talaga, nakita ko rin talaga, he did not use his celebrity or his father's celebrity. Uh, in fact, during the campaign period lang when they were already hitting the numbers. But masipag lang talaga siya sharing his platform, his vision for Pasig City. And even if konti lang yung nakikinig sa ibang barangay, 
patuloy at padayon siya sa pag pag uh, share ng kanyang message of his platform and his vision for Pasig City and it worked na beat nila ang Eusebio uh, after 30 years in power and now he's doing really well and and the Pasig the Pasigenos are now reaping the benefits of voting Biko so hopefully we can have more Biko Sotos kayong mga nakikinig uh, some educators here some teachers some some students plan your political career time to really replace some of our traditional political leaders. So uh, we will have most likely the same families running in 2022. Uh, we have Pacquiao, we have the Marcoses. Of course, the Duterte might still run. So we hope that we can really open the pipeline for new names. Kasi sa demokrasya, ibang demokrasya at ibang bansa, bukas naman yung demokrasya nila sa ibang mga pangalan. Dito, kung sino lang yung paulit-ulit ang mga pangalan, siya pa rin yung mga binoboto natin. So hopefully, hashtag, ito nga yung sinasabi ni Vico, hashtag iba naman. So yan, the Revillas, Pacquiao, the Villars, of course, um, while they have some degree of performance for some, of course, by and large, uh, we have to ask ourselves, are they really beneficial to our democracy? So when the country, when the wealth of a country is used by a handful to make the rest of the population virtual slaves, that is unhealthy because it is no longer a democracy. So sabi nga nito, at ito laging nagmimima, no, politicians and diapers must be changed often and for the same reason, sabi ni Mark Twain. So youth survey, quick lang, pasadaan ko lang, ano ba yung pinag-iisip ng mga youth ngayon? This is a survey from the National Youth Commission in 2015 where nag-survey ng 2,700 young people all over the country. So 78% agreed that political participation is important. That's good news. Uh, 59 or almost 6 out of 10 express interest in social or political issues. So mas maraming kabataan ngayon ang mas mulat at mas nag, uh, nagtitake interest in political issues. Ano? They try to influence policies on issues they feel strongly about. Pero konti lang yung bumuboto at nagpaparehistro. Only 30, uh, 32% did not vote in the elections before May 2016. Um I'll just skip this, but to be honest, in terms of registration, konti pa rin ngayon ang nagpaparehistro. Of course, merong pandemic, pero tahimik yung mga COMELIC offices. Ano? So the sad news and the red flag is that 50% of youth prefer to work abroad. Uh, they are not satisfied with the state of governance in the country. And eto, 70% or 7 out of 10 believe that corruption is unavoidable. This thinking should be challenged. Young people now should think that corruption is avoidable by voting young uh, by voting more young people into office and, and re, um, removing the trapos, the dynasties, and the plunderers from public office. So one bad news is that more young people actually voted based on TV ads, based on the last name, more than they did for the platform. So that's a sad um, revelation. Sana magbago din ito as more and more young people have access to information. So malaki yung role ng kabataan in, in, in tectonic shifts, political tectonic shifts. Um, kabataan yung nagbuo ng KKK that removed the Spanish regime. Of course, the FQS or first quarter storm during the martial law regime naman. Ang kabataan yung nanguna doon. Edsa dos that removed Arab out of power. Mga kabataan ang nag, nanguna doon in terms of text power. Pork Barrel, the Million People March, recently in 2014, kabataan din ang karamihan nandun. So we're encouraging more young people to run for public office. Jesse Robredo ran for public office at a young age of 29 in Naga City and was able to shape governance in Naga City. He empowered people there. He had the People's Council. Um, naging organisado ang mga sektor doon sa Naga City. And Ito lang yung challenge at hamon natin na tinatapon sa ating mga kabataan. When will you do a Robredo at the age of 29, which is also the same age that Vico Soto ran for mayor. Sana when you reach 29, uh, sana tumakbo kayo kung meron na kayong plano, you've, you've done your part, you've readied yourself for the role. Uh, Vico Soto, for example, studied masters in Ateneo School of Government. Pinaghanda niya yung sarili niya. Hindi siya dahil lang sikat yung tati at nanay niya. He readied himself. He joined NGOs that uh, like GWatch, which held um, LGUs accountable, which is a champion for accountability and transparency. So, ang takeaway dito is hininda niya yung sarili niya for the role. Hindi siya basta lang tumakbo dahil anak siya nito or anak siya ng mayor or anak siya no, which is what is happening sometimes. So, <clears throat> we hope that you can also do a Vico Soto for, that, uh, for the SKs who are here, for the young youth leaders who are here. 
So ngayon, we help champion na meron na tayong anti-dynasty provision sa sa SK. I'm down to my last 10, 5 to 10 minutes, no? But the SKs, we're hoping that more SKs will do electoral politics properly. Huwag bumili ng boto. We have to perform because you have to prepare yourself. Kayo ang hinaharap na you are the future leaders. Uh, you are now the leaders in the present because you're SK, but you are the future councillors, mayors in your town, in your city. So we're hoping that the SK will be a good pipeline. And with the reforms that we did for SK, uh, we did see merong maraming mga youth leaders, student leaders, mga magna cum laude na tumatakbo na dahil wala na ng uh, dynastic na mga SK, mga anak ni Barangay Captain na tumatakbo rin. So, uh, malaki ang youth voters in 2022. Um, roughly 12 million Gen Z new voters which is age um, yung Gen Z naman will be 18 years old to 25 years old by then and then millennials are 26 to 41 years old 15 million kayo kung sino man ang 26 to 41 years old si Gen X which is my generation uh, 10 million naman kami uh, uh, which are 42 to 57 years old so paano ba natin to resolve well voice out vote and volunteer and dami daming so it looks like itong kongreso natin, ayaw talaga nilang ipasa ang political party reform. Ayaw nilang i-reforma ang ating political party system dahil nakikinabang sila nito. Ang freedom of information which holds people and leaders accountable and to be transparent, 33 years na after the constitution was passed, after it was first filed by uh, Senator Raul, the late Senator Raul Rocco, hindi pa rin ipapasa ang freedom of information. Ang anti-political dynasty which is found in our constitution, Wala pa rin enabling law after the constitution was passed in 1987. It looks like ayaw talagang ipasa ng kongreso a law that will actually ban them from running or from banning their wives and children from running for public office. So how do we voice out? We need to advocate for political reforms. We need to speak out against political dynasties, traditional politics. Vote buying, please do not accept. If you will accept, donate nyo or expose nyo. Uh, ang, ang, ang vote buying na mangyayari uh, dahil iba-iba din yung rates no, per province. We have to fight this information. What studies have shown is that the Philippines is one of the biggest victims of fake news or disinformation. We would rather call them disinformation rather than fake news. Ano? But ang dami-dami nandun yung infrastruktura upang magpakalap ng fake news. Kaya yung mga nanay natin, yung mga tita natin nagpapaniwala sa mga sinishare ng ibang influencers na bayaran. Marami talaga mga influencers na binabayaran upang magpakalat ng fake news. And we have to fight this because at the heart of a good democracy is information that is truthful para malaman ng mga butante ano ba yung totoo, sino ba ang dapat ibuboto, ano ba yung track record ng politician na tumatakbo. So while we have information in our hands, ang dami pa rin nagpapakalat ng fake news. And we have to fight this as we head off to 2022. Of course, we have to focus on platforms. Ano ba ang plano? Politikong ito. Wag lang personalities. The pandemic will be with us. We have to hold our leaders accountable. Tatakbo kang presidente, anong plano mo sa vaccination? Anong plano mo para maiwasan in the future ang any biotechnological um, na mga pandemic or health pandemic? So another one is we have to hold politicians to account. Tweet them, email them. Uh, ano ba yung plano nila? Ano na ba yung mga naipasa nila? Ask them for their performance for the past two years. Ano ba yung naipasa nila? Kasama ba sila sa nagtanggal ng ABS-CBN na franchise that remove information and remove jobs? Kung kasama sila, wag nyo na silang iboto. Report EPAS to the anti epal page kasi ang dami-dami pa rin mga makakapal ang mukha. And of course, you can join people's initiative like Prima Kapamilya. Sa Ateneo School of Government, uh, we, uh, we want to partner with you guys on Pinoy Voters Vibe. So we have a project we're in. Uh, it's a youth polls or a youth poll pol polling of infrastructure because we want to hear the voice of young people. If you want to join us in really making sure na magpa-polling tayo sa, para hindi naman maging false yung mga uh, survey, we want young people to really uh, have their voices heard. Uh, so our voice, our vibe, our vote, please reach out to me if you want to join this program of Ateneo School of Government and Ateneo Police Center because we want the voices of young people heard. At least we know, ano ba yung importanting issue para sa kabataan? 
Uh, ano ba yung tingin nila sa mga platforma ng mga politiko? At sino ba yung mga politiko na susuportan or uh, boboto ng mga kabataan? It's very important for us to put a platform and voice for young people as we head up to 2022. Of course, importante, you have to vote, register and vote. You know, in 2019, 4 mil million ang nagparehistro in in just two months from August to September of 2019. Apat na million ang bumoto ang nagparehistro. Ngayon, hindi pa umaabot sa 1 million na kailang buwan na tayo. Of course, may pandemic, pero which is why it's a good time. Huwag po tayong maghintay sa deadline na September bago tayo magparehistro. So it's very important dahil a vote, your one vote, is also equal to the one vote ng mayayaman. Whether mahirap or mayaman ka, pareho pa tayong may isang boto. And this is what this is the beauty of democracy. Ngayon, magparehistro ka, pero kung wala ka talagang mapagpipilian sa mayor mo, Meron kang isang mayor na epal, merong isang nagnanakaw, merong dynasty na uh, land grabber, eh di huwag nyo silang iboto. Pumunta ka pa rin sa presinto, sa voting precinct, pero you can just blank the mayor. So ito yung tinatawag natin na protest vote or none of the above or nota. So pwede yan because if more and more people will not vote for the mayor, for example, makikita nung mga future leaders na ay, galit na pala yata yung mga tao, sinusuka na yung choices na political system natin. So that should signal and give a message to our mayors that they should do better. Otherwise, in the next election, 60% ng nagnota ang buboto sa kalaban nila. Of course, vote buying, if you can accept, but please donate it or expose the, the trapos who are uh, buying our votes. Please, please do not vote for trapos, plunderers, and dynasties. Kung kulelat ang performance ng munisipyo nyo sa covid Huwag nyo nang iboto si Mayor kung hindi nyo siya nararamdaman. Itong dynasties, bakit? Sila lang ba yung magaling? So we need to be able to replace dynasties with good people. And look at Pasig City now. They are enjoying and reaping the benefits by replacing the Eusebio dynasty with someone like Biko Soto. Hopefully, more and more young people can plan. If you cannot run for 2022, plan ahead for 2023, 4, 5, 2025. Uh, para na makatakbo kayo but you have to prepare yourselves for the task at hand of course we need you to volunteer uh, we need tributes na talagang mag-volunteer in our political advocacies so um, let me share with you from the bible no? Ito nga, learn the guile of the serpent even as you keep the purity of the dove you need to know the rules of the game how to play the game but you need to keep your integrity intact uh, diba? so ito yung lagi pinaparaphrase ni the, the late Senator Ul Rocco so with that, let me end with this slide. You know, this one is done by a national artist. His name is um, Cesar Ligaspi. He's from Bicol, one of the modern cities. Tinatawag siya na tatay ng modern color, ng, 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 ng Filipino color. Dahil napapalabas na yung tingkad ng kulay ng mga paintings niya. Pero tinanong siya ni Senator Ol Rocco, he's a national artist, paano daw ba niya napapalabas ang tingkad ng kulay ng mga paintings niya? When in fact, colorblind pala siya. He cannot differentiate red from green. So medyo black and white or gray scale lang yung nakikita niya. No? Pero sabi niya, so paano siya nagpipaint ng pagkaganda-ganda? So sagot niya kay Raul Rocco, you know what Raul? The colors that you see on your shirt, the colors that you see outside, the colors you see in, on nature, they're all very important. But what's important is for you to find the color within you. Then the paintings will be beautiful. So I think this is our challenge. All of us have to find in our inclusive democratic spaces the color within us, the power within us as voters to really create an inclusive democracy. Isang demokrasya kung saan kasali tayo at hindi tayo na, na napapa out or napapalabas. If all of us will be able to contribute our own color in our municipality, in our city, we will be able to paint a beautiful painting of our locality, of our country, the beloved Philippines. Sabi nga sa isang kanta na led with this, uh, every color, every you is represented by me and you. So with that, maraming salamat, uh, Seya, maraming salamat, SB. Mabuhay kayong kabataan. We hope to see you in 2022 and 2025. Tumakbo kayo, makilahok, find the color within you. Mabuhay.
Thank you so much, Mr. Leon Flores, for that very engaging and uh, very impassioned uh, uh, presentation. And thank you for opening up to our viewers here on YouTube, on Facebook, the realities, the challenges, but also the invitations that emerge so that we can move forward towards a more inclusive democracy here in the Philippines. And I, I was happy to know no, uh, that the figures were really that big in terms of the youth vote. I think people have always been debating about this youth vote. Uh, although I'm glad to say I'm part of the 15.3 million, so mm -hmm. at least for now, I'm still yeah. part of that group. <laughs> in any case, uh, just again, a reminder to our viewers on Facebook and on YouTube, if you have comments and questions, please type them up. Put them up on the comment section on our YouTube and Facebook channel. We will... Uh, read some of them later and we will ask the resource persons as well during our Q&A portion. However, at this point, we'll already get to meet Dr. Gideon Lasco. He is a physician, a medical anthropologist, and a writer. He is a senior lecturer at the University of the Philippines Diliman's Department of Anthropology and also a research fellow of the Development Studies Program here in Ateneo de Manila. I'm sure you're familiar with his column in the Inquirer Second Opinion, which won a Palanca Award for Essay. Among his many other interests are, have to do with medical population, uh, populism during the times of a health crisis. He's also been uh, following the impacts of the drug wars here in the Philippines and in Asia and practices and evolving perceptions about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Gideon Lasco. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, Brother Ed, uh, Leon, it's a pleasure say, uh, to in, for you to invite me today. What a joy to, to talk and engage with young people. Uh, even now, during a pandemic, that we don't even see each other physically, I think that uh, we need to redouble our efforts to really continue the work. And kudos to all of you, all the organizers, all the participants for, for still being here with us despite all the challenges that we face today. And some of it has been identified by Leon earlier that 
tells us that we really need leadership. We really need people to guide us. But at the same time, we ourselves can be leaders in our country. So in my short presentation this morning, I would like to share with you some of the thoughts that I have regarding elections. I would like to lay down a case for why we need to be involved in elections next year but also why we need to be involved in our country beyond the elections, beyond the political process. So, of course, young people, and I don't even want to define young people. Some statistics say up to 25, to 29. Some people my age or even anybody's age would like to think of themselves as still young. Diba? Palaging joke yan sa Pilipinas na people are very sensitive about their age. People want to to be to look younger. People feel flattered when they're said, Para ba, wow, talaga? Kanyan na yung age mo? I thought you're younger. So people are flattered by the thought of being young. It's a premium. There's anti-aging creams that you can see advertised in, in EDSA. And people go through great lengths, plastic surgery, even risking their, their lives in the process, paying so much just to look younger. So young, bakit nga ba, why do people want to be young or look young? There's beauty, it's seen as beautiful. But at the same time, to be young is to have the future ahead of you. And because the future is ahead, you will experience the country more than the rest of the people will. So if you think of Duterte, how old is President Duterte? He will only, in all likelihood, he will only live for at the most, siguro, 20 years or so. And while people like a 15-year-old will have an entire several decades ahead of them. So who between someone in his 80s or someone in his teens will experience life in 2050 and will be concerned about what 2050 brings? And even though we think that politicians are in power for just a few years. But that's not the case because they have real life consequences beyond their terms. We will even be paying debt incurred by the Marcoses until after Duterte. So andun yung kanyang legacy tuloy pa rin. We'll keep on paying the debt. And if we end up loaning, borrowing so much money from about the, for the vaccines, then Ganun then you will end up paying for it for decades. So that's, an, uh, that's a reason for us to really be engaged in the electoral process. And young people as leaders understand issues facing us today better than some of many of us. Uh, you're tech savvy, you know and understand contemporary trends more than your elders. So you are best suited, not just to be participants, but to be leaders in our political process. And we have seen this in climate change. It's young people who are taking up arms to, to protest the inaction about climate because you know that the planet is, is something that you will have to deal with for the rest of your life. So we need young people as leaders. But why do we need to, to vote? Why do we need to, to, to really register, as Leon encouraged us to do earlier? What, is the, what are the rationales for really voting and participating in the electoral process? Well, the most basic is that we need to vote because we need to change the nation in a way that will improve our lives. COVID-19 showed us that the decisions of our leaders can spell the difference between life and death. It can spell the difference between a country that has overcome the pandemic and a country that is still basically thinking of more and more lockdowns because we have failed in our response. So your vote matters. It can change the nation. Now, you might think this is already cliche, but I think some, some truths deserve to be repeated. That will a single vote count? Of course it will. Of course it does. There's even some examples of 
in the Philippines. Sabi nila, rare. It's rare daw to happen. But in fact, when I looked at the literature, it actually happens every so often that an election is decided by a coin toss. That means that it's just one, one 18-year-old who did not register and decided, na, bakit? Why will I do it? It would spell the difference between an, an incumbent dynasty, member of a dynasty, and someone who promises change. So imagine just one vote. It's decided by a coin. So do you think that a coin is better than you in deciding the fate of your town? Well, if you think otherwise, then register and vote. Now, it leads me to a point that I want to also emphasize because most of the time when we think of elections, we think of the big elections. We think of the big positions, president, senator, vice president. Very excitingly, many of us watch the U.S. elections and how Joseph Biden won. And historically, Kamala Harris emerged as the first uh, woman to be vice president. But at the same time, there's local communities again. And Leon also mentioned Vico Soto. And there are many other mayors in the country who are doing good work. And we have seen in the pandemic that your mayor will basically determine the success of your uh, experience, like your experience in the pandemic and even vaccines now. People are talking about vaccines. So naging LGO level yung usapan when it comes to acquiring vaccines. So to vote is to contribute to your local communities. Even I am guilty of sometimes failing to be engaged locally. When we think of political engagement, we think of Duterte, we think of the opposition, Robredo, etc. But what about your local communities? What about your barangay even? Barangay officials make decisions that can affect you and can improve your, your life as well and the community. So we need to be engaged in our local communities. And voting is an opportunity to, to do so. Kilalani natin yung ating mga local officials. And even consider running for office in your municipality because that also can make a difference. So the first two, sinabi ko na, yung isa is to be a part of the changing the nation, to be involved in local communities. The third rationale for, for voting is to contribute to the integrity of our electoral process. We're concerned about vote buying and there's always a debate of how to solve vote buying. Kasi nga, can you really blame people who get nothing from our politicians? and decide instead to receive the few thousands that they can get instead of getting nothing at all in their perception. So in a way, vote buying is something that has structural, structural reasons. But by voting independently and without refu by refusing to be bought, then your vote means one less vote that's been bought. So when you vote, you contribute to the integrity of the electoral process. And there's many of you young people who can be part of this. Now, the, a fourth reason, and I think this might be a very important reason, is when you vote, you're invested in your country's future. Um, it's so easy to observe from a distance. But when you vote for in an election and you vote for someone, you feel, in a way, responsible for that person. Binoto ko yan eh. Bakit nagkaganito? Diba? So when you vote for someone, you're even more in a position to hold that person accountable for his actions. You can say, well, ito yung pinangako mo, kaya kita binoto. Bakit ganito yung ginagawa mo? So contrary to perceptions and contrary to people's attitudes that they're double down on the people they, they voted for, diba? Na... Because they voted for someone, they keep supporting that person. No, no. Because you voted for someone, you are entitled to hold that person to account for your vote. But even if you don't vote for someone, if you didn't, you didn't vote for someone, you're also entitled to do so because you're a citizen of the country. So I'm sure many of you are thinking, and that's empirically validated by the survey that Leon uh, presented to us earlier, I'm sure many of you are thinking of going abroad. But when you vote, you feel that somehow you're invested in our country's future. 
and that will motivate you to contribute more to our country and to find a way to thrive in in the country so to vote is to feel invested parang nilalagay niyo yung sarili niyo sa bansa by voting so it's one thing to observe an election from a distance for example the US elections but it's another thing to be actually be part of the process and it will give you moral capital to hold our leaders to account now the last rationale is to vote is to encourage others to do the same we might think of ourselves as not influential and we might even laugh at people who call themselves influencers diba parang it's already taken a bad name in itself yung mga social media so called social media influencers however i do not see social media as negative and i think that that's what you young people can also contribute to the discourse is that you don't see social media as necessarily negative it's part of life it can be used for for evil it can be used to foment madness and authoritarianism as we saw with Donald Trump but it can also be used to engage others to reach people to influence them to decide uh, and even beyond social media you have your family members if you're a student in a university then for sure your parents are listening to you as well in terms of what you think for sure you have cousins you have relatives you have neighbors and they will listen to you uh, medical students nga eh when i was a medical student we always joke na parang first year medical student pa lang people are consulting us na about different medical conditions at wala pa kaming alam sa pagdoktor because people really look up to to sometimes if you're a student you feel you feel down and you feel na walang katotohanan yung ginagawa nyo. But in fact, people place so much faith in you. People believe in you. And don't underestimate your own influence in your own social circles. So when you vote, you encourage others to do the same. Uh, and don't be afraid to engage your family with conversations and, and discussions about politics because it's important to engage them. And if you have influence in different platforms, then by all means use them to encourage others to vote. However, so I've already run down five points. First is that elections can change the nation. Elections uh, by voting, we are engaged in local community. So that's the second. The third is the vote is to contribute to the integrity of the electoral process. The fourth is to vote is to be feel invested in the country's future and lastly to vote is to encourage to do the same however elections are not the end all be all of democracy so democracy is not a once in three years once in six years exercise that we just show up in the polling station and that's it no democracy is an everyday process we need to cast our vote in issues we need to weigh in so ako, as a columnist i find myself weighing in in different issues should we do this should we support this plan to get vaccines from this country or should we do should we pursue this policy so we need to cast our votes in a way in every issue that affects us by making our voices known ideas heard even criticism and we do that individually but also by joining organizations by organizing by by writing by developing our means to communicate including in i right i encourage you to write essays actually we we in the inquirer actively solicit mga young blood contributions and by all means i encourage you to do that bihira na kayo nagsusulat sa mga kabataan and i think our educators will agree na we need to to, to do that so elections are not the end all be all of democracy and by putting too much faith also in the electoral process sometimes we end up with negative sentiments like voter blaming which i think is inimical to nation building uh, so i will encourage you to vote but if it's okay i will say, tell you now that don't be afraid to make mistakes if you honestly and thoughtfully decided on a candidate and then that candidate turned out to be palpak that candidate turned out to be a failure 
it's okay to make mistakes. What's not okay is to insist in supporting that candidate kahit na mali na yung ginagawa niya. So, let's vote wisely but at the same time, don't be afraid to make mistakes and don't blame others who voted for the wrong person because what we need is to build a coalition that's large enough and not to divide each other through this mga divisive blaming and shaming. Yung mga politicians, they can be shamed because they're accountable to the people. But voters, we need to educate. Now, again, the country is larger than our politics. There are many activities we can do. Uh, even cycling, nga eh, diba? if there's one thing that can come out of the pandemic, it's that people are coming out in the streets and claiming the roads for cycling. And I think that's something that young people can also be contributing to. And let's be reminded that young people can also be swayed. Sorry, I got disconnected somehow. That's the re realities that we have. But like I was saying earlier, it's not an assurance. Just being, just because you're young doesn't mean that you're wise, diba? So we need to be critical. And I think that's where education comes in. Not just any kind of education, but critical thinking. And, and I think that's the strength of our universities, our educators are really concerned about how to build critical thinking. So we're not here as and I'm also, uh, I also teach in a university, so I know what it means and the challenges involved. So I express solidarity with all our educators. But the critical thinking is not here for us to tell you young people who to vote, but to have a conversation with you in our classes and it, with the hope of learning from each other how to vote, how best to vote, what are the criteria that we can use to judge politicians, what are the criteria we can use to evaluate their track record. So critical thinking is there to question what they say. Totoo ba sinasabi nila? Are their promises really realistic? Can, can, that, can a drug problem really be solved in six months? Is it realistic to expect vaccines uh, will restore our country back to normal last year and ngayon, 2021 na. So we need to question always both our educators and also these politicians. And that's an effort that I'll be happy and I'm sure many of us will be happy to join into and, and contribute. So that's it. Uh, basically, I'm here to, to answer later with Leon and add all your questions and inquiries. And we need to have a conversation because more of the ideas will come from young people. But I would like to end by saying that I, I know many of you are facing challenges now with the pandemic, mental health challenges even, because we're all isolated and, and distant from each other. But, but the education that you're, you're pursuing, it will be worthwhile. It's something that will be useful, not just for the nation, but for you yourself and, and your family. So don't give up. Just continue and uh, ito na natin to. The country is worth living in. But that will only be, 
a possibility if we all do our, do our share. So thank you. Thank you, Seya. So once again, good morning and thank you for tuning in to our fifth uh, webinar for this GPG National Conference. Again, uh, we will be reading your comments your question, and your questions in the comment section on our FB and YouTube page. But it seems like Mr. Leon Flores has started answering already mm -hmm. some of the comments and the questions. Thank you very much. But I think before we go to the comments and questions, meron munang mga nagpapa shout out, nagpapa greet, no? We'd like to do a shout out to Father June Estoque, the president of Cabarus Catholic College, and his group of Christian form, uh, the Christian Formation Core group, and student leaders who are watching us right now. And it seems like there are a lot of students and teachers watching. They're mentioning also their schools and their sections. So mm -hmm. it seems like there's an attendance check going on here, no? But thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, Maraming mga marami yata yung ano Bisayan followers ni Sir Leon kasi maraming mga taga Cebu, uh, si Kikor, mga taga Miss Or na nanonood, no? Uh, but thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Uh, we've we have several questions here and uh, maybe this is a good uh, place where we can start since most of uh, since both Sir Leon and Dr. Lasco mentioned about uh, current realities that may be discouraging us from engaging, and one of which are really the whole issue of uh, dynasties. No, uh, so if that's the case, there's one question here from Norma Albutra: Who can cut this dynasty issue? Could it be the Comelec, or or could it actually be Congress? Because I think it's also related to a second question here having to do with the quality of our constitution. Could it already be obsolete? Could it be toothless? So I, I leave it up to either Dr. Lasco or Sir Leon to answer that question. Sige. Um, I was part of the Andayam or Anti Dynasty movement sometime 2013 to 2015. We had a people's initiative. We asked people to um, really boost the clamor against dynasties and, and it became a campaign issue like people really ask 
Uh, so now we hold them accountable kasi nagpa-promise that they will push for anti-dynasty pero hindi naman pala no. So about the third was very clear about it that he's okay with it. <laughs> but we need an enabling law. Uh, coming together with attorney Lac- Alex Laxon at that time in our movement, we also questioned Comelec umabot niya sa Supreme Court eh. But obviously and we kind of know already the answer that the Supreme Court struck it down that it's really an enabling law by Congress that can stop political dynasties in their tracks. So, ang question lang dito, yung politiko mo ba, yung House of Representatives na congressman or congresswoman mo, ano ba yung stand niya on political dynasty or part ba siya na political dynasty? Kasi may ibang configuration naman kami pinupush na medyo reasonable. Ibig sabihin, up to second degree of consanguinity, hindi nga fourth degree eh. So, medyo ano naman, we were try, we tried to balance the version that we were pushing for in Congress. Our challenge now to young people, to the electorate, is ask them, for ask your congressman or woman, ano ba yung stand niyo sa political dynasty? So, we need to hold them to task. We need to hold them accountable for their vote, for the bills that they file. It's not enough na nakikita natin sila, namimigay ng ayuda, nagbibigay ng ganito, which comes from us anyway, pero din naman natin yon. So, wala talaga yung dapat... Uh, patronage or patron client yung relationship natin with them ano del pera natin yun so we need to ask them properly what will be their stand in 2022 and if you have your current congressman for example si congressman for two no but one among others who are pro pushing for the anti dynasty enabling law we need to support them and make noise for them that we we love them and we commend them for their action okay Dr. Lasco, do you have any thoughts to share on that matter? or? Well, yes, uh, definitely. It's in the Constitution, diba? so it's very frustrating that after decades already, there's no enabling law. And Congress, I don't even want to look at depressing figures anymore about how <laughs> filled with dynasties Congress is because it will only depress me. But it's a majority. And even the more enlightened people actually in our government Some of them have come from dynasties. So I think that in terms of responding to this, we cannot really count on Congress to, to, to act on, on it. We, we can demand. It will not stop us from definitely clamoring our local officials from doing so. But at the same time, the power of the ballot is the only thing that can, can end dynasties. It's happened before. It's happened in some... Govern some pro- provincial uh, elections and local elections. Na the independent candidate defeated the incumbent. That's part of a, a dynasty. Uh, so we really need to use the power of the ballot. That's why I emphasized earlier the need for local engagement, not just national. It's true that we need to be aware and engage in national issues. But what about our own cities and towns? Do we know the mayor? Do we know the civil society in our own towns. Sometimes it's even harder to be a columnist in a local newspaper than a national newspaper. Diba, Leon? And, 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 uh, and people have learned this the hard way. Uh, it's very pain. It's deadly way even. Uh, it can be fatal because it's contested. These incumbents, these dynasties will stop at nothing to erode, to, to prevent the erosion of their power. But we, So we need to really come out in force in terms of elections to vote out the because it's been demonstrated by studies including by Ateneo School of Government that provinces that have political dynasties tend to fare poorly tend to fare poorer as compared to those that are led by non uh, political dynasties so there's empirical evidence to show that this is really a failure in, in the country And even without that study, diba, parang how can you hold accountable the congressman if he, kapatid mo siya and you're the governor? Diba? It's very clear that this, this will not work. However, it's so, in, it's so interspersed. It's so ingrained in our country that it will really take years of elections to end this. But it's okay. We have, we have to be here for the long haul. We have to be committed. That's why kayo, mga young people, don't let go of your your indignation about this, di ba? When you grow older, dapat andun pa rin yung commitment because this will take many elections. 
Okay, thank you so much. If I may add lang, Sir Dr. Lachman, yes. Mother Ed, if, if, I may add, if I may add quickly lang, when I was with the National Youth Commission, we did push for the anti-dynasty provision in the SK. And I think that's what, the, that's the power when you're on the table, when you're in the room when it happened. Diba? It's very important that you use healthily the power that you have to push for reforms para talaga mag-push natin ito. So we need more and more people who will say, I need to be in the room. I will not be outside the system. We have to be within the system and make it work because there's really no other way to go about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this, imagine, ah, think about it. We can be depressed with so many things that are happening in our, in our country. But at the same time, over the past decade, there are actually good laws that have been passed. Uh, there's freedom of information. Uh, it's not being properly implemented. But at least, there's an instrument to hold people into account. There are even may mga NYC and these are agencies that are still part of the government and they can be instruments of change. Even agencies like the Dangerous Drugs Board require a NGO representative. And there are, there are agencies in the country that require a youth representative as well. And even yung mga international organizations like ADB, but they're starting to require that dapat merong youth engagement. So there are avenues for participation that we cannot underestimate. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Leon and Dr. Lasco. Uh, before we proceed to more questions, because th- there are more interesting questions coming up, I'm being asked to remind, again, those who wish to receive a certificate of attendance this can only be done upon completion of the evaluation form. So in a few minutes, the link that is in our caption page will already be available so that you can fill up the evaluation. And uh, it will be live from 11.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. today. Again, from 11.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. so that you can get your certificate of attendance. Now, going back to the topic here at hand with our Q&A, and I like the whole idea of what we've been talking about here how we can engage current realities no? and really that whole notion that we have to do to work on checks and balances. There's coalition building, especially when we have to consider how we are to fight seemingly inevitable realities like political dynasties. Sinabi nga natin, it's so ingrained in our culture. Actually, when Dr. Lasco mentioned that earlier, it reminded me of this saying uh, uh, by Father Jack Carroll from the Institute on Church and Social Issues. Parang if uh, such societal change takes time, then we don't have time to waste. We should start acting now and really uh, investing in uh, what we have to do. There's an interesting question here, and I think this also will involve some uh, radical humility on the part of Catholic educators. But I'd want to share the question, and maybe you have your own thoughts no, and insights here. Most of the trapos are from Catholic schools. And I must admit, uh, some of them also come from, from Jesuit schools, from the different Ateneos. And as Catholic schools, we always try our best to educate them as Catholic educators. Uh, in your own thoughts or maybe reflections on this, what can possibly be the best thing to do so that these y- the young of today become good leaders, if not the best leaders in the future? Medyo parang pang Miss Universe. Hindi ko lang alam kung parang pang Miss Universe question na yun or... I know. But if you have thoughts, uh, Dr. Lasco or Mr. Leon Flores? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a very provocative question, very good question, actually. Uh, the empirical, so the question there is the um, schools like Ateneo. So the argument is on one hand, sa kanila ba nang gagaling yung mga, mga, mga dynasties? Well, I think that to be fair to universities, we can find all kinds of trapos from all schools. UP, uh, we have. Pro- I am ashamed to say that we produced some of the worst of them, diba? including Marcos. So it's not necessarily dependent on schools. However, we have to acknowledge that elite institutions tend to be places where people can only people who can afford them both economically, socially, academically, can go to, diba. So in terms of going to Ateneo, what are the pathways to go to Ateneo? It's either, so of course, you need to be able to afford the tuition fee, a scholarship, 
But before you can even get a scholarship, you need to be a good academic performer in high school. So you need a good school in the first place for high school or elementary. So in, in many ways, there are many academic social determinants of academic uh, capital or academic performance. So I think that that's an inevitable. I think that it's not necessarily the fault of, of the institutions, but at the same time, I think that being more diverse in the student population can help. Can help. Be, be, that's part of education as well. Eh? The people you meet in the classroom, the people you talk to. So I think that for schools to really be concerned about diversity is one step to make sure that at least if if you're someone who is a part of a dynasty. If you've met as your dorm mate, or if you've met as your classmate, this guy from an indigenous community, then surely you will be more sympathetic to to mining issues that affect indigenous people. So I think that we should be mindful that the education in schools that does not just come from the curriculum, but in the way that we engage people, the, way, the people we meet in the university. So being more inclusive in terms of students and also faculty will go a long way in terms of creating that culture of democracy and inclusivity. I agree. Well said, Dr. Lasko. No? And I agree with you when you say that, you know, some of you shouldn't put the blame on the school, but they do play a role. I think that's also, you, you mentioned that naman, the malaki yung contribution. And also, it's, a, it's multifactorial and damning factors that can really shape the way a leader is built or formed. So, may dalawang forces lagi yan inside of us, the monsters that fight, no? Si Godzilla at si King Kong. Kung sino ba yung mananalo, kung, kung whether it's the good part of us or the better part of us or the, the worst part. Uh, so, for example, uh, the entrepreneurship is taught in schools like Ateneo and even uh, university and Catholic schools. Pero ang problema, ang mga politiko natin sobrang entrepreneurial. Ginagawang negosyo ang public service. So those kinds of things, medyo, medyo mali naman na they use it for their own personal vested interest. Another point I'd like to raise, maybe uh, because we have good Catholic educators here, it's very important to stress that in order for us to become an inclusive democracy, we have to create inclusive democratic spaces in schools, classrooms, in our organizations, in our institutions. Sometimes hindi ito napopronounce eh. I think we have to say it, that we cannot fight tyrants if in our own classroom we are tyrants ourselves. While we do have rules and we ask our students to follow them, but if it's unreasonable, if it goes beyond the bounds of what is written in your charter or in the school or class, um, na, na, the curriculum, I think medyo problematic yun. We have to um, make sure that agency or yung personal na agency na mga students are also at play. Their creativity is not stifled. Their, their freedom to speak out, of course, within the bounds of respect and decency are still respected. So if you shut down a student for their idea or opinion, we are not creating democratic spaces already just because you feel threatened by what they're saying. And that's the same that we are no different from the politicians that we contend or fight against or the dynasties. So I think it's very important that democracy is actually a day-to-day -day thing. There has to be democratic spaces. If they cannot find this in their families or in their homes, they'll tyrant yung tatay nila, then we shouldn't be the tyrant that we are as educators and as teachers. We should be nurturing. We should uh, really form them and really create a democratic space so that young people will appreciate democracy for what it is and what it should be. Am I still connected? <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so I brother think, Ed. Uh, I think see si brother Ed yung nagahang. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, guys. So maybe we can talk about some of the other questions that you you see uh, early on. Yeah. Um, ano ba yung mga online questions that we see? Sorry.
Thank you. Oh, sorry for that. Uh, part of our reality, not just uh, in disruptions in the internet, but also with our electricity. Uh, so, but good thing we were able to restore it immediately. I think the, there's a gen set. In any case, I thank you, uh, Leon and uh, Dr. Lasco, for that. I, I do agree with what you've mentioned. No? In terms of, uh, I, I think it doesn't, while schools do play a very crucial role in forming leaders, uh, it's not only there. But I also like the point that was raised about even in schools to create democratic spaces. Uh, to allow the to allow even our students to have an experience of democracy in the everyday, in the mundane situation, so that all the more it empowers them uh, for the bigger choices ahead. And that's interesting because there's actually one question here uh, from one of our viewers uh, because, and we've mentioned this, and I think because part also of the situation of some young students, university students, is that often they feel that they could not express themselves in universities, not so much because of the universities, but because of their own educators and teachers. It is. Okay. Uh, I want to uh, see Yi Yi here wants to ask, how can the youth challenge educators who are supportive of this current administration, even if it is ruled or mired with bad governance. As learners, we are taught to respect different political views. We are taught to actively participate in inclusive democracy, but we're also taught to spot what is already uh, objectively clearly wrong and speak out against that. How can these I, uh, I, both these ideas, or, or not just the two ideas, but those three can coexist uh, I've encountered some of my, even some of my own students would share about how some of their teachers are also certain, so fixated on certain political opinions, even if they feel that they're already wrong. How, what could be your advice? I think this is more asking for an advice already. Maybe this is a student asking the question. Anyone, Dr. Lasco or maybe Sir Leon would want to... Um. Ako, I'm, I'm the type na mas kinainis ako sa friends ko na sobrang hardcore na they, alam niyo may may hypocrisy eh, na parang wow, Catholic school ka, tapos pro-AJK ka, you're okay with mass murder, you're okay na walang due process. But I think this is the beauty of democracy. We respect all sides so long as we're civil when we discuss. Um, and maybe don't engage trolls because you're just paying them more. Uh, kasi it's useless. Eh. Uh, I think we should just engage with people whom we think we can reason with. And at a certain point for your mental health, just stop also if you feel that you cannot get through a person. I mean, you don't have to be able to the point. I mean, uh, there are many out there who are, we'd like to think, are reasonable. Ibig sabihin, they can be issue-based. Ano? They're not really ano, totally to a personality lang na parang, parang, parang just yung treatment nila sa isang leader. Uh, and but there might be some so i think we need to know when to draw the line yung mga tita or tito natin na talagang medyo wala nang pag-asa which is why i said you know you can teach old dogs new tricks ano so i don't want to belabor the point uh choose your battles i think the battle front is with young people they're still uh, they're in their perspectives their world view their political opinions can still be shaped uh, and can be influenced properly uh, mas maayos yung pwedeng foundation na ilagay natin versus mahirap talaga yung iba. So know when to stop, but engage nonetheless, but choose your battles and take care of your mental health. <laughs> okay. Or ano naman, yes, and I, I support that. Uh, we have to maintain the respect for people. Just because others are not respectful doesn't mean that we have to be the same. Diba? We cannot respond in kind. We cannot uh, sling mud at each other. If people sling mud at us, then we need to refu We need to elevate ourselves from it and not wallow in the same mud and throw it back to to people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in the in the education realm, of course, if you're a student and then if you have a teacher who's very was very supportive of 
a certain political leaning, then I think it will also depend on ano klaseng topic yung yung subject nyo. So if your subject is botany or entomology, then I don't think that you necessarily have to engage that uh, person in terms of the politics of it. Uh, choose your battles. But at the same time, if you're really being told to participate in activities that are you don't believe in, for example, to attend a rally to support a certain uh, cause, regardless of which political side, diba? if you're asked to sign something that is a signature campaign mm-hmm. against your will, or if you're told to stop tweeting about uh, something and you feel that it's within your right as a person to express yourself, diba? Parang who, who is this botany teacher to stop me from tweeting about politics? So we have to draw the line. But at the same time, it's not just challenging it, but how do we challenge them? That can also matter. Sometimes people decide to take it to social media immediately and rant about that teacher in social media. So it's questionable whether that kind of strategy is effective in terms of actually um, it might be better to elevate it first to some other mentor or a faculty member. I think, and speaking of mentors, I would like to raise the importance of mentorship and mentoring in academic institutions. Uh, many of our students are, are lost. They have questions like the one that they raise. And they need someone who's a really a warm body, someone who's actually there in their school to be able to, to do this. So we must really strive as educators to be mentors because there are many students who require th- those questions of us and sometimes they have no one to, to ask those questions because that's very context-specific. Eh? It will apply mm-hmm. like in UP. Maybe I can give advice about how to deal with that. But that will not be applicable to Ateneo. So we need local mentors and mentoring to deal with those kinds of issues. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lasco and Sir Leon. I, I, I do agree with uh, what you've mentioned in terms of mentoring. And if we're talking about building communities, inclusive democratic spaces, I, I, part of the whole process of mentoring is We've see, I, I've seen it also in some groups, a kind of intergenerational dialogue. The youth have the energy while the not so young anymore already have the wisdom of the years. And the, having those spaces for dialogue and are very constructive. Uh, we'd like to read some of the uh, affirmations here, some of the comments. Very thankful for the uh, insightful, analytic, and engaging inputs from Dr. Lasco and from... Sir Leon Flores no? uh, says here, Mr. Flores is a dynamic and a spectacular advocate of the topic. Dr. Lasco naman, being a doctor himself, has diagnosed the ailments of, of the country, the ills of our present government and officials. So thank you uh, once again. I, there's an interesting question here about voters' education because we're always so used to a typical, the typical way, I, I think for several decades already, of how voters' education is done is that to often discern it based on who are the existing candidates and try to, I, I even remember even back when I was younger, there was this criteria that the CBCP came out if the person is makajos, makatao, makabayan, makakalikasan. And so it all depended on the candidates. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, since this was discussed in both your inputs, if there's any study, kung effective pa ba yung mga ganitong classing voters education program? If not, what are alternatives to such a way of doing voters education? I leave it up to either Dr. Lasco or Mr. Flores who wants to start answering or commenting on that uh, question. Well, I would think that quality education is the real voter education that we need. Uh, it's not something that we can, parang one month before the election, and throw out some infographics. That's not, <laughs> that's not voter education. Voter education is really investing in <clears throat> kind of quality education in which young, our young people feel confident about 
their ways of thinking, that they're critical of what politicians say. They know to evaluate facts. They know to distinguish between facts and fiction, facts and <laughs> fake news, information and disinformation. So there's this that project, that long-term project of of building this kind of education. However, there are also some measures that can contribute to educating, informing voters that can be accomplished through collaborations between journalists, between uh, fact checkers, education educators, and academics. So that includes, I think, holding politicians to account based on their track record, just putting it out there. <clears throat> Ito yung mga nagawa nito, holding them in to their, based on their promises, what have they said in the past. I found it, and even in YouTube, I find it very much engaging in mga videos showing politicians what they said before and what they said after, di ba? Na bumaliktad sila and very clearly caught on, <laughs> on video saying something, praising, mm-hmm. like condemning EJKs in 2015 and then defending EJKs in 2017. So that might, so some of these things might appeal to and might help people decide. However, <clears throat> facts are not enough. Eh. I think values mean more than facts in terms of uh, voter, a meaningful voter education. So it's not enough to, to say that someone killed this many people, but the real voter education is to say that this is morally unacceptable and this is integrity, something that we must fight for. So hindi siya, ano lang, it's not just factual, but also moral the kind of uh, decision-making we want to to help our young people acquire is not based on facts, but based on values, I think. And that will that's why we need to involve the church. We need to involve religious groups. We need to involve... Um, we need to involve even our popular culture uh, people, media, and what kinds of values do, do they... Because we cannot tolerate, we cannot glorify wealth, diba? I, I think that in many ways, the Marcoses have been glorified alongside para mixed feelings tayo with the Marcoses. Eh? Now, on one hand, they're being uh, called out for their what, the amount of money they stole, but at the same time, their lifestyle is almost glamorized, diba? Ito yung life of Imelda. So how can we expect young people to really be un- unequivocally against <laughs> kind of people when they're partly glorified by our popular culture. Yeah. So we really need to, it's not just a matter of throwing out some materials out there. Yeah. Voter education will have to come from all of these sectors working together. Uh, ako for some time, there was a point where I no longer believed in voter education, to be honest. But I felt so, and I'll be honest and I'm humble enough to say that, but I think I'm, I'm back in the zone now I feel that there's there's a chance and there's hope. Simply because I'm looking at it from a standpoint of supply and demand. Eh. Voters' education is the demand side. I think from a supply side, kahit anong educate natin sa kanila, oh, bumoto ng tama, bumoto ng hindi corrupt, pero ang tumatakbo naman ay corrupt, magnanakaw, epal, uh, trapo, dynasty, parang there's a disconnect between what we're actually trying to educate them on if we try to let them be critical about it, but the system doesn't churn out the right choices. So I had that phase, when, and, and I'm still in, I'm there when we have to balance both the supply and demand. We have to have a good supply of politicians churned out by our political parties, young people who can gear and rear themselves, start to become councillors, SK first, then councillors, then good mayors like Vico Sotolid and among others, and then really have good choices. Kasi it, that's one part of the, that's one side of the coin. Kasi kahit anong turo pa natin about being platform-based, hold them accountable, that's okay. We can, can, we can continue to do that. But what the system now, it is skewed against us, no matter how educated the electorate is. The choices that our political system is giving us, I mean, san hindi talaga acceptable in the realm of inclusive democracy. So I think it is both. And I agree, the school is a huge way to do voters' education. I think 
we have to invest in relationships. Hindi to pwedeng one day ka lang mag-expect ka that when you tell them and impose your views on them dahil nag-donate ka sa kanyal that they will also do the same. That doesn't make us any different from politicians. I think it's really relationship building, trying to really hear and listen to each other because that's the beauty about democracy again. Really trying to see where they're coming from. Because ang hirap-hirap talaga. Bakit mo sasabihan na, o oh, wag kang bumoto sa kanito, sa mayor mo. Eh si mayor yung nagbigay sa akin ng scholarship eh. Siya yung nabigay sa akin ng SAP during the pandemic. But, but, but we're asked if we try to let them appreciate that that money is not from mayor. And well and good, but that is actually taxpayers' money. And that they are actually doing their job. That kind of thinking can be part of voters' education. No more okay. clientele, pat patron relationship. We have to debunk that. Na hindi tayo beholden sa ating politicians. Trabaho nila yan, pera ng taong bayo na ginamit dyan. We have every right. So we should also be rights-based. Ano ba yung karapatan natin? What right do we have as citizens to hold our politicians accountable? So that if they do not make themselves deliver, then we remove them in the next election. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lasco and Mr. Flores. Ang ganda, no? Kasi we, we actually try to talk about all these ways, no? In which, and true enough, because we've already said that even the political exercise is not just limited only to elections. Therefore, the education of it has to be in the everyday thing. Uh, I like how it has even been phrased that there's always that translation of values, of what we claim to believe in, and make sure there's an integrity of that with our actions and decisions. Because otherwise, there really is a dissonance. But also, more than that, more than just that kind of perspective, like what Mr. Flores had mentioned, we have to also look at how the system seems to disincentivize uh, any effort to voters' education. Uh, and I guess that kind of breeds also a certain helplessness that some people, some young voters feel na, Eh, wala naman na akong masyadong choices. But as we've said and we've seen, uh, especially during the last elections, eh, uh, the last midterm election, some of us who were watching that closely felt it was a, there was a glimmer of hope that even if what happened in the senatorial elections may not have been favorable, but there were glimmers of hope in the local elections with new up-and-coming uh, fresh faces. No? Or not so fresh faces, but at least they have a much better track record. And so I guess maybe addressing all the Catholic educators and administrators here, there we, we've, we've already shared a lot. No? Uh, create democratic spaces, allow for critical thinking that goes beyond uh, simply the classroom. The whole idea earlier of giving diverse experiences, just uh, not just in the classroom, not just with the personnel, but also even the engagement of the students. And I think some student formation programs here have to really uh, be planned out to complement well what, what we can offer in the classroom, especially in the time of pandemic. There has been more, certainly some advantages have also been revealed in terms of the flexibility that we can do this. No? Uh, it's interesting because uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of plugging also here uh, something that Simbahang Lingkod ng Bayan has been doing. We, for the past years, we've been trying to experiment on a voters' education program that really goes beyond uh, just elections, but allows for community organizing, capacity building, and allowing the community to be able to articulate its own dreams, its own issues, and then eventually, hopefully, lobby for that and create spaces for dialogue with their politicians. Uh, then again, no, uh, this is the, this will still take a long time, but as we've said earlier, then let's not waste time anymore. We really have to start mobilizing and engaging the youth in our schools. And maybe we only have a few minutes uh, left. No, uh, let's uh, I, I again just want to go through some of the greetings here, uh, especially an affirmation to Dr. Lasco and Mr. Flores. Thank you so much for the very timely and updated. Uh, inputs that you have given, very interesting topics also that you've mentioned. And also thank you for the the tips on how we can engage people more or especially the youth in our schools to provide those spaces wherein they can think, they can share their ideas. 
hopefully also uh, this can translate into better choices and better results in the 2022 elections. And maybe before we come to a close, uh, since I think we've answered most of the questions, because some of the questions were overlapping also that we've shared, maybe some last uh, words from our resource persons, any other Perhaps you have invitations or, or other things that you also still want to share to our viewers here on our SEAP FB page, Simbahang Lingkod ng Bayan and on Radyo Katipunan. Maybe we can start again with uh, Mr. Flores for some final words. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you SEAP, thank you SLB, thank you for the invitation. Uh, most definitely, we have our work cut out for us this experiment that we call democracy is an ongoing experiment no uh, that hopefully we can get right um, we've been doing it wrong for a long time i think uh, time is of the essence and i hope that this will hopefully write itself with this generation with the gen z because you have information at your fingertips and one thing going for us is and i hope the elections will push through no the pandemic has changed and the, it has somewhat changed also the dynamics between their local leaders and the electorate. In the same manner that this will also change the way people will do elections. So primarily, wala na yung mga sorti sorti big events, wala na yung mga ano, most likely we have to call them out. So this whole circus about our political electorate democracy, how we do elections, will somewhat change also. And we who are um, champions of electoral democracy, sana we will be able to find ways. Tayo na medyo may, may kamulatan on what how we should do things. Uh, we have to engage our politicians the proper way, the right way. They will most likely engage us online because the offline will be a bit harder. So that kind of changes things, hopefully to our favor. So let's take advantage of that because young people are online. You are connected. You have information at your fingertips. And you have the right, as sabi nga ni Dr. Lasko, no? One vote counts, and that is an equalizer. Uh, let's make use of that. Let's voice out, put our voices out there. Let's vote, and let's volunteer. So let's try to improve on this experiment that we call democracy. Dagang salamat. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Dr. Lasco? Yes. So I would like to reiterate my thanks for SLB and SEAP. And Leon and Ed, this has been a fantastic conversation with, with you guys and for, with all our questions as well. I would just like to end, and Leon, so I would just like to end by reminding all of us that at a time when we think that there's no there's no hope that's that's immediate or proximate to us, let's bear in mind that in history there's an unexpected things that can happen. As long as we are on the right track, we can find success. So bear in mind that in our own country's history, no one expected that Duterte will be president in 2015. Right? If you ask anyone in May 2015, a year before the elections, who will be president, probably they would have said Baka Binay or Grace Poe. So, so many things can happen. So we, we need to be prepared. Also in 2000, uh, 2009, before Cory Aquino's death, no one expected that Pinoy will, will be president as well. So well, I, these are things that are beyond our control. But what we can control is equipping ourselves with the right tools, with the right relationships to build this democracy, regardless of what happens. So let's be prepared for the moment when the opportunity meets our principles, meets our preparation, meets all our brightest hopes for the country. Because we need to keep believing in this country. This is our only land. This is our only homeland. So I would like to end by encouraging all of us, let's continue the work. Let us be the ones to encourage others to continue the work as well. Because we need to keep hoping, keep believing in each other keep holding faith in our democracy. So yun lang. And again, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Lasco. And again, uh, yun nga, some parting words to our... There's there's so much actually that we can do because there's also so much that needs to be done. We can either choose to fight disinformation actively, lobby for issues that 
are of value to us, especially to the poor and the marginalized. For the Catholic educators there, the, the task of forming future leaders is very real. We've seen that right now with, some, with how some of them have come out of our schools. But also, and more importantly, uh, maybe just to organize in your communities that for those who have not yet registered, to be, to be sure that they register within this year before the deadline for the registration for the next elections comes and then later on for them to mobilize and come together in communities and discern how they will vote and how they will be more socially and politically involved. Of course, as you said, this is an experiment, but we're, we're here to help. Uh, we're here at SEAP. We're willing to help all our member schools here. For those who might need help in terms of social political education programs, uh, follow us on Simbahang Lingkod ng Bayan and maybe also on the page of Ateneo School of Government. Uh, they're doing a lot of webinars, some uh, research symposia, and of course, you might want to follow uh, Dr. Gideon Lasco on his Twitter account or even in his weekly inquirer column, The Second Opinion. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, before we end, we would like to thank our uh, web host for this morning, Raxo City, and the Private Education Assistance Committee for being our wonderful partners for this year's National GPG Conference for the webinars. Mm -hmm. Join us again uh, on Feb 1, 9 a.m. for our webinar on Ending Gender-Based Web Violence with Care, Respect, and Empowerment. Uh, we have people from the Ateneo uh, Gender uh, Studies Hub, even from Miriam College and Sister Helen Graham as our resource persons for that webinar on Feb 1, 9 a.m. On behalf of our president of SEAP, Sister Marisa Viri, RVM, and the SEAP Board of Trustees, Father Iking Balongag, the Programs Committee Chair and the GPG Champions, Mr. Jose Alan Arellano, the Executive Director and the National Secretariat. This is Brother Ed Colmenares saying thank you and good morning. Thank you very much for tuning to our webinar today. Thank you.
Oh, oh, oh. 